We're continuing our studies in Chapter 7 on enzyme kinetics and inhibition, and in this lesson we want to look at other types of reversible inhibitors. It's important you keep in mind the principles we learned in the previous lesson, that these are reversible inhibitors. That is, they can exert their effects only while they are bound to the enzyme and not if they are unbound. First, we'll look at non-competitive inhibition. In other words, it's not competitive uh, with the binding of the substrate. So in our last lesson, we saw in competitive inhibition, the substrate and inhibitor could not both bind at the same time because they were binding to the same site. Binding was mutually exclusive. But in this example of inhibition, the binding of the substrate is not competitive with the inhibitor because they're binding to different sites. And that's illustrated in our figure here. On the upper left, we have the free form of the enzyme. It might bind the inhibitor first, but because it's binding at a different site, the substrate can still bind to the active site. And here we have the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex. Conversely, we could bind the substrate first, but that would not prevent the inhibitor from binding. And again, we have our unproductive enzyme substrate inhibitor complex. So as you can see, the binding of the substrate is not competitive with the inhibitor, and so we can't simply add more substrate to make the reaction go, as we could in the case of competitive inhibition. Since it has no impact on substrate binding, it cannot alter the enzyme's affinity for substrate, and therefore there is no change in Km. However, in this case, notice even with substrate bound, if the inhibitor is present, we cannot make product. And so that changes the rate at which we convert substrate to product. That's going to lower our Kcat or Vmax. Now keep in mind, it is a reversible inhibitor. So even after we form this unproductive enzyme substrate inhibitor complex, if the inhibitor dissociates with the substrate bound, we can now make product. We just can't make as much in the same amount of time, and that's going to lower our Vmax. It's going to lower it by this factor alpha, and I would just remind you, here's our expression for alpha at the bottom of the screen. Remember that's directly proportional to the inhibitor concentration and inversely proportional to the Ki. Recall that is the, a measure of the enzyme's affinity for the inhibitor. Now we call this alpha prime, and that just tells us that it's changing Vmax rather than Km. So again, in the case of non-competitive inhibition, the substrate could be present and yet we won't make product and so it's changing that rate. So remember, with competitive in inhibition, it increased the Km and left the Vmax unchanged. In the case of non-competitive inhibition, Km is unchanged and Vmax decreases. So in many ways, it is the opposite of competitive inhibition in terms of the effect on the kinetic constant. And all of that has to do with the form of the enzyme to which the inhibitor binds. Now, as it turns out, this type of inhibition is pretty rare because it would require that the inhibitor would bind, have absolutely no impact on substrate binding, and yet prevent the substrate from being converted to product. This does occur but it's pretty rare. More commonly, we see what is referred to as mixed inhibition. That is, we change both kinetic constants. That's why it's mixed. Generally speaking, we'll lower the Kcat or Vmax and increase the Km. So it's mixed in the sense of it's kind of a combination of non-competitive and competitive. So again, we'll lower the Vmax by this factor alpha or alpha prime, and we'll increase Km by a factor alpha. We might not change them both to the same degree, and that's why we have those two different expressions for alpha. So again, in this same case, the inhibitor binds to either the free enzyme, and then the substrate combined, or it binds to the enzyme substrate complex. In either case, so long as the inhibitor is bound, we cannot convert substrate to product. Once the inhibitor dis dis dissociates, we can make product, but we can't make it at the same rate, and that's why Kcat or Vmax decreases. But it does have an impact on substrate binding. Although substrate still binds, it doesn't bind as well, and that's why we generally increase Km. There are some cases, and this is mentioned in your text, where a mixed inhibitor actually lowers the Km, but that is far less common. 
and so in all examples of mixed inhibition that we will discuss we'll refer to that as the Vmax or KCAT decreasing and the KM increasing and that's illustrated in the graph here so again we have our traffic signal colors the green curve is in the absence of the inhibitor there's our hyperbolic plot it reaches the saturating value where enzyme is saturated with substrate and that gives us the Vmax at one half Vmax, we follow that over to our green curve and that gives us the KM. Remember this is the true KM because it's in the absence of the inhibitor. But now if we add the inhibitor, because we're decreasing Vmax, we, we reach a different saturation point. We have a new Vmax. Now since we have a new Vmax, we have to calculate a new half waypoint, a new one half Vmax, half of that new uh, or altered Vmax. So we follow that over to our red curve here, we follow that down to our substrate concentration, and that gives us the Km in the presence of the inhibitor, and you'll notice in this case the Km is increased. So in this case a mixed inhibitor decreased the Vmax and increased the Km, and this is generally what happens in the case of mixed inhibition. In the next type of inhibition, it's referred to as uncompetitive inhibition. Notice in this case the inhibitor binds only the enzyme substrate complex. For a competitive inhibitor, remember the inhibitor bound only the free enzyme form. In non-competitive or mixed, the inhibitor can bind either the free enzyme or the enzyme substrate form. In uncompetitive, the inhibitor only binds the enzyme substrate complex. Let's see how that works. So I have one figure in the upper right here, which is perhaps conceptually a little bit easier to grasp. Here's the free enzyme on the left, the substrate is this orange ball here, and there's our active site on the right portion of our figure here. Substrate binds, and now we have the enzyme substrate complex. You'll notice when the substrate bound, it caused a conformational change. And that opened up a binding pocket for the inhibitor, pictured here as a blue triangle. And now the inhibitor can bind and we form again the unproductive enzyme substrate inhibitor complex. So you'll notice in the free enzyme, without that conformational change, there's no place for the inhibitor to bind. And that way, that's why it never binds the free enzyme. The substrate binds and that causes a conformational change that actually facilitates the inhibitor binding. Again, we have an unproductive enzyme substrate inhibitor complex, but as soon as that inhibitor dissociates, we can convert substrate to product. So we have a similar situation as in the case of non-competitive or mixed, and that is we are going to decrease Vmax. We'll look at that again in just a moment. Another example of what might happen is this figure from your book, and that's pictured on the bottom of the screen here. Here we have the free enzyme, it binds the substrate, and now the inhibitor can bind. In this particular case, the inhibitor binds adjacent to the substrate and can only do so in its presence. This is different than a competitive inhibitor because it's not binding at the same site as the substrate, only adjacent to it and it cannot bind in the absence of the substrate. And that's why it only binds the enzyme substrate complex. And so that's distinctive about uncompetitive inhibition. Let's see how those kinetic constants change in this case. Well, we actually find that the binding of the inhibitor, because it lowers the concentration of the enzyme substrate complex, actually favors its formation. In other words, it actually lowers the Km. It makes it easier for the substrate to bind, or more likely. This is more easily seen if you think of this as an equilibrium. And remember, if we pull something away in one direction, we're pu pulling it towards formation of something else. So in other words, if we look at the enzyme-enzyme-substrate complex as an equilibrium, and another equilibrium between the enzyme-substrate and enzyme-substrate inhibitor, as we form more of the inhibitor, the ESI complex, we're pulling away from forming the enzyme-substrate complex. And so we're actually favoring that formation. This makes it uncompetitive, that is, the opposite of competitive. So remember in competitive inhibition, it actually diminished substrate binding. 
In this case, it actually facilitates substrate binding, and this can only be understood uh, according to Le Chatelier's principle, the law of mass action. As we decrease the concentration of the enzyme substrate complex, which we will do as we form the ESI complex, we're going to favor formation of ES, and that makes the substrate more likely to bind, enhances the enzyme's affinity for substrate, and therefore lowers the KM. However, we still have this unproductive ESI complex. As long as that inhibitor is bound, we get less substrate converted to product, and so it will decrease the KCAT or the VMAX. In this case, it decreases both VMAX and KM and does so to the same degree. So we have the same factor alpha decreasing VMAX and decreasing KM. In our next video lesson, we want to see how effector molecules can actually change the pattern of an enzyme's activity. We want to see also if there are other ways that we can regulate enzyme activity other than by reversible inhibition.